all of you to be here, uh, not listening to the State of Union address, but then thinking about the state of FPGA in this room. Right? <laughs> uh, we have a very intriguing title, it says that uh, FPGA is suffering from innovators deliver, which I will explain why we come to this uh, topic. Uh, before we start, I first want to give credit that uh, it's not my idea to have this panel, and we were brainstorming various kind of ideas. Many of you know the other uh, sort of a long time attendee of this conference is Professor Gunnison Rose at the Toronto University. He came up with this idea. Uh, we talked over the lunch, he convinced me it's a good idea, and he convinced the panel of the rest of the committee. Then he said, let's do it together. And then he said, by the way, I'm going to be away doing sabbatical in Shanghai. <laughs> So I have to learn that. You have a great idea, you get your friends and, uh, inspired to do the work, and then you take a sabbatical. So, <laughs> uh, so some of you may ask well, then why we ask this question, that the uh, FPGA industry, in fact, has been one of the most uh, innovative in the uh, industry right so far, and have been riding on the most long. So if you look at the pure capacity, it goes to from a few hundred lots in the 1980s, these days to all the way to over multi-million dollar processing elements. It could be four lots, it could be five lots, it could be six lots. Not only just the capacity, the capabilities to introduce, the heterogeneity introduced in RPGA is also uh, amazing, right? From the embedded RAMs to some of the uh, multi-standard program I.O. supports, and the most uh, the PCI interfaces, Ethernet, Mac, most recently on 3D, stacking, uh, analog, uh, mixed signal support, and also extensible uh, um, pro uh, processing uh, subsystems. Uh, I have to say the slides is coming from Xilinx, but uh, many of the features are shared by uh, the FPGA industry in common. Um, as a result, uh, the system power is going down, uh, the cost is going down, and uh, the system performance has been going up. So, so what's the problem? Uh, in fact, there's another good news I have to say, is that the FPGA um, industry has the highest margins in the semiconductor industry. Uh, if you look at this column, AMD, uh, um, start with AMD 22%, Altera 69%, right? Intel and the 62%, MU, this is a good quiz for now graduate students, which company is that? Because in both. This is a Micron. And 11% uh, uh, and media 51% is I think also in the 60s. Right? And then you look at the, the net margin and uh, AMD is losing money, I mean for the past year and the Altera and the Zilinx are all in the 20s and 30s. By the way, don't go off your buy stocks based on this table. <laughs> there are many other factors that we have, may affect the stock price. <laughs> so this is actually another good news that uh, with the PGA industry. So you may even wondering why we should sit here and spend an hour and a half talking about uh, uh, whether FPGA has an innovation problem. However, the problem is that uh, the overall market share. And in fact, uh, uh, Wang mentioned that I was doing the, the first startup at A+, and I was providing a uh, physical synthesis tool of FPGA. At the time, I really paid a lot of attention to FPGA market. It's about 1% to 2% of the overall <coughs> semiconductor. And then, I, when I asked to do the panel again, so uh, I looked it up. Uh, I did some simple math that the overall market about 300 billion, and the FPGA industry has grown a lot, but it's about 4.5 billion. Uh, the division gives us uh, the ratio is still again about 1.5 percent. So, in a way that uh, after in the past 15 years we made more progress. Another way I can tell you is that uh, we're in a, a recruiting season. Uh, I'm trying to get a, a FPGA candidate to come to UCLA as a faculty member. I was very passionate about that. And some other faculty has a different opinion. That the one faculty just says, Jason, you have to remember, this is just one percent of our semiconductor industry. Why are you so excited about it, <laughs> uh, Just to be fair, that uh, someone, uh, in fact, this Misha sent me this slide saying that, in fact, it's not all that bad. If you look at the ASIC, this is where FPJ is addressing, it did grow more significantly just for the, in the spirit of full disclosure, from about 19% in 2005, grow into 30%, so that 11%, that, uh, right, uh, in the, the 2011. 
And the projection is that it's going to do 37%. That's in 2016, so we'll have to see whether that happens or not. Um, but however, if you look at also the composition of the PGA customers, uh, it's not just the pure market share, it's look at the, who are their customers. This is the breakdown of Altera. Majority of that coming from uh, telecom, wireless, and then the industry, networking, and computer storage, and others. And the islands is very much the same picture. That, uh, and the communication industry, consumer automobiles, and the data processing. And what's more interesting is that uh, uh, my student helped me to dig out the annual report from 10 years ago. And uh, you look at the Altera's market share and the uh, Lightning's market share. It's very much the same composition, right? So that's maybe even more alarming is that uh, why we are stuck with these uh, existing customers. Base. So that makes me wondering uh, whether all the innovations we have, all these features and the capacities we added are just driven by the customers. In fact, it's even worse is driven by the existing customers. Now you may ask the question, what's wrong to listen to the customers? Uh, there's actually some concerns. So some of you, maybe many of you have read this book called The Innovator's Dilemma uh, from, by Clinton, the, the Christian from uh, uh, Harvard Business School. And uh, here are some quotes, right? What he says is that uh, there are times in which it's right not to listen to customers, right to invest in developing uh, low performance products that uh, promise lower margins, and the right to aggressively pursue small rather than substantial markets. And he goes on and says uh, that the innovative, one of the intermediate deliveries is that the good companies often begin their descent into failure by aggressively investing in products and the services that, uh, that their most profitable customer want. Uh, so here is the, the comments uh, from uh, Intel CEO, former CEO that Andy wrote, talking about this book, he says, uh, the book addressed uh, a tough problem that the most successful companies will face eventually. It's lucid, analytical, and scary. When you read these quotes, that you start wondering whether we are going down that path or not. So that's actually the reason uh, why we are having uh, this discussion. You may argue that uh, what's wrong with these uh, customers? This might be the most exciting things going on in the industry. Uh, to some extent, it's true. Maybe it's more true that uh, in the 1990s or early 2000s. But I have to say, there's also a lot of other excitement going on in the industry. Uh, this is one curve that uh, talking about the users on Facebook, right? Started from nowhere in early 2000. Now, very recently, crossed the one billion user threshold. And so that's a tremendous growth. That's why everybody is very interested in big data these days. So that's driven by uh, multiple companies uh, of, of similar characteristics in growth. Another very different uh, um, sort of a uh, space is the genome sequencing, right? We started with the first genome sequencing at a cost of about almost three billion dollars. Again, it was in the early 2000s. And since then, the cost of that has been dropping very dramatically. And in fact, faster than the Moore's Law. And uh, the target is to get down to about $1,000. And I think we're not too far away from that, right? And uh, the, 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 the fact we can do this is that because of all these uh, short reads, we can have a lot of them. The rest will be all computation problems. How do you put the puzzle together to actually decode and put the sequence into that? So are we addressing these uh, opportunities? That, uh, so that's actually the question we're going to ask tonight. And another question you may ask is, are, they, uh, are there emerging technology you may take advantage of that to address these uh, uh, new market segments? I think that this is hopeful. Let me give you one example. Um, so at this conference, some of you have heard the, the name multiple times, Conway Systems. They're not the only one, but it's one of the representatives using uh, FPGAs for large-scale computation, especially for big data. So this is actually the slides they showed to me, uh, they shared with me that uh, uh, compared to a 12-core Intel processor state of art, and uh, they can actually process about uh, almost 10x faster with four user FPGAs and uh, coupled with uh, 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 processors in a memory coherent fashion. Um, so this is actually one type of uh, uh, non-traditional use of PGAs. And uh, 
Another example, of course, I'll be totally biased if I don't talk about UCLA result. Um, for example, we published a paper last year that uh, we showed that uh, you don't have to go with FPGAs. You can actually have so-called uh, fine-grained uh, composable accelerators, where in the chip you have a, a lot of uh, accelerator building blocks. Um, and also, you have your buffers being all distributed. And uh, at the, uh, given any application, you can look at these computation kernels. You analyze these kernels at the compile time in a static fashion. However, you compose these panels. I mean, most time that people will just take these kernels, synthesize into IPGA, don't do that. So what we show is that uh, you actually hold off, you compose these accelerators, all of these accelerator building blocks at the runtime, as many as possible. And, uh, and then you do some global uh, memory buffer allocation. You get some fantastic result that uh, uh, on the average 150x performance gain, uh, perform uh, that all the way to 300, 400x gain. If you look at the energy reduction, it's even more impressive in the order of 700. So, but this is not FPGA. Nevertheless, it's programmable, it's composable, right? Will be something of that kind should be looked into as uh, in the map of future FPGA generations. Um, I'm not sitting uh, here to answer uh, that we have a, a, a distinguished panel of uh, experts. Uh, this is actually the order we'll go. That uh, we first we have uh, uh, Chuck Sucker, that is a, uh, a technical fellow at the Microsoft Research. And he has his B.S. degree from uh, uh, 1967 from UC Berkeley. Spent 40 years in research labs, including Xerox Park, uh, DAC Research, and also more recently Microsoft Research. It's a long list of awards, and the ACM Software <coughs> System Award, and the uh, IEEE member, uh, IEEE Fellows, and the Academy of Science and uh, Engineering, and the uh, uh, Charles Schrock Draper Award, and also John uh, IEEE Monument Medal, and the most recently, the, the ACM Turing Award. I believe, uh, Chuck, you are the first Turing Award winners we have at this symposium. Thanks very much for, for being here. We also have uh, um, Jonathan from UC Berkeley, and his BS degree uh, is from UC San Diego, and MS PhD from uh, University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, uh, he again representing a very different kind of a uh, type of users. He's interested in uh, spatial, parallel, and unconventional programming languages, uh, and the computing, and also robotics. So he's going to tell us a lot about how he is thinking about using FPGA as a new type of a computing and the prototyping devices. And he has been a research scientist at the, um, MIT for eight years, whole position at Stanford and the ICSI, and also a founding member uh, of the, uh, the other lab, uh, where he researched on programming methods and geometric workflows for fabrication. So after these two sort of quote unquote uh, traditional users, and then we have uh, uh, Robert uh, uh, representing upcoming the, the FPGA companies, uh, uh, being the CEO of uh, uh, Acronix. And he, uh, Robert, was, uh, has the ME degree uh, in business and microelectronics and the uh, BS degree in applied physics. And he has 25 years of experience in semiconductor industry. And uh, prior to uh, Acronix, he was the CEO of uh, Altastic Semiconductor <coughs> and also the vice president of product planning at Altera, <coughs> responsible for defining Altera's programmable logic solutions. Uh, prior to Altera, he also had the multiple positions at uh, LSI Logic and the Fair Child, um, where he was doing ASIC uh, technology, he has sort of experience on both sides. Then we have a representative from the two FPGA leading companies, Altera and Xilinx. Uh, so we, first we have uh, Misha Buich, and uh, Misha's PhD and MS was from the University of Minnesota and uh, uh, the BS degree uh, EE from uh, University of Belgrade. He started his career at the Bell Labs back in 1978. And uh, he, uh, prior to 2000, he had diverse kind of uh, positions in EDA companies, including Cadence, Mantographics, Silicon Compilers, and also Silicon Design Labs. He was uh, a co-founder of that company, in part uh, to this acquisition by Mentor. And uh, uh, currently, he's a CTO of Altera, but before, right before that, 
He was the senior vice president of R&D, managing actually the whole research and development uh, organization responsible for all software, IP, system solutions, and the semiconductor products. And uh, uh, the last one and not least is uh, Steve Trimberger, a fellow at Zilinx, representing another leaders uh, in the IPGA industry. Um, and he is heading the circuits and the architecture <coughs> of the Zilinx Research Lab in San Jose. Um, he designed the bitstream security <coughs> functions uh, employed by Zilinx IPGAs, and his research led to the development of Zilinx uh, two and a half D uh, stacked silicon uh, technology. He has over 200 patents uh, in IC designs, FPGAs, and ASIC architectures, uh, CAEs, and also cryptography. <coughs> He's a fellow of both ACM and IEEE. He has twice been the program chair of this conference and also the general chair. Um, as a professor, I'm used to give homeworks, but it's hard to actually assign homeworks to the such a distinguished <coughs> panel list and a group of panelists. Uh, but nevertheless, I, uh, here are the questions we came up with them. We said, uh, is the pressure or desire to keep the high uh, profit margin preventing an uh, IPG industry in breaking into new, uh, some lower margin markets? And uh, are the innovations of the IPG industry mainly driven by the existing customer base at the expense of ignoring some other emerging needs? And uh, why IPG industry is stuck with this about the one to two percent market share of the semiconductor industry. And uh, also, uh, are the emerging application domains, uh, are there emerging application domains that can be served by the IPGA industry, but not currently, and that due to the concern uh, of uh, margin, market size, etc. cetera. Um, and finally, are there new technologies that you see that the IPGA industry can leverage uh, to break into some new market segments. And uh, finally, I think everyone's benefiting from more slow, but what happened if that uh, uh, stops or slow down? Uh, what are the new innovations needed uh, that will still um, 